Welcome to the AATC Emergency Medicine channel. Uh, today we will be discussing regarding drowning and submersion injuries. So let's go into the So as defined, it refers to the primary respiratory environment impairment of an individual due to submersion in a liquid medium such as water. It's a simple definition. It refers to a primary respiratory impairment of an individual due to submersion in a liquid medium such as water. It is otherwise called as submersion injury. So when you will suspect a drowning, suspect drowning when an individual is rescued following water submission with following signs such as altered sensorium, cuff or pulmonary rails on auscultation, hypotension or shock, hypoventilation or absent of pulse. So basically uh, whenever you have decreased perfusion to the organs, uh, to the brain it can cause altered sensorium. When the uh, excess fluid get accumulated inside the lung, you will have pulmonary rails and auscultation, which is in turn uh, due to the pulmonary edema, hypotension or shock, hypoventilation or absent pulse. So this will be the spectrum by which the patient can present to you. So uh, we will suspect when uh, drowning when you see following uh, signs. Now there are a lot of synonyms that has been used previously. And ILCO, that is the International Licensing, Licensing, Licensing for uh, Circulation Guidelines, suggests drowning to be used in place of previously used terms including dry and wet drowning, active and passive drowning, silent drowning and secondary drowning. So there was a lot of terminology that has been previously used but uh, ILCO has made it mandatory that uh, this synonym should not be used and only the term drowning should be used and terms such as near drowning, dry or wet drowning, active and passive drowning, secondary and delayed onset of respiratory distress should not be used. So this is the uh, definition and uh, you should be using the terminology drowning or maybe a submersion injury. Now as you know the adult chain of survival for the cardiac arrest for the in hospital and pre-hospital, similarly we have got a drowning chain of survival. Uh, which has been uh, represented here. You can see uh, prevention of drowning that is the most important priority like uh, when you see cardiac arrest you have to prevent the cardiac arrest for an in-hospital scenario. You would have a meeting, you post resuscitation meeting everything like that. So first most important thing is to prevention of drowning that is the first thing and recognize distress. Somebody is in distress and ask someone to call for help. If somebody is around you have to call for help and provide flotain, flotation that is the next thing. So whenever uh, there is a high chance maybe a swimming pool, maybe a beach. So all these equipments, the preventive equipment should be made available to prevent submersion injury. And as soon as the patient is drowning or he has gone into submersion, removal from water is the first priority that you have to, you have to immediately rescue him. But make sure that you yourself are safe. You, are, you know swimming and you are an expert enough to do that then only go ahead and do otherwise the expert personnel should do and provide care as needed and seek medical attention. So this is a simple chain of survival for drowning. So you have the prevent drowning, be safe in and around water, recognize distress, ask someone to call for help, pro provide flotation to prevent submersion, remove from water only if safe to do so and provide care as needed and seek medical attention. So that is the drowning chain of survival. Now what are the likely risk factors for drowning? There are a lot of likely risk factors for drowning. The most important ones are males, age less than 40 years, low socioeconomic status, poor education status, living in rural areas, epilepsy, it is associated with around 15 to 19 times risk, substance abuse, trauma, exacerbation of existing cardiac diseases, syncope, attempted deliberate self-harm, exposure to water, leaving kids unattended near water. So as we told previously, the most important part is the prevention. So you see the vulnerable group population like children, they are more prone to develop the submersion injury when they are kept unattended near water for a long time. So that should be avoided. So these are the likely. Now there are certain associated conditions uh, following drowning which the patient can have. The most important one is the primary one is the hypothermia. You can have primary as well as secondary hypothermia. What is primary hypothermia following drowning? It occurs rapidly due to submersion into icy water less than 5 degrees Celsius. Secondary, it is due to subsequent heat loss through evaporation during resuscitation attempt. So this is primary hypothermia and secondary hypothermia and there can be associated trauma and uh, we have uh, said uh, seizures which has got a high risk factor uh, for drowning. Now let's see uh, what are the causes and what exactly happened during drowning. Submersion in a liquid medium resulting in a liquid bar air interface at victim's airway that prevents breathing. So that is the primary culprit. So there is an uh, interface 
where the liquid will go and interfere, interfere with the water, interfere with the air and as a result the victim stops breathing or it interferes the breathing and there can be associated seizures and there are certain conditions that may cause loss of consciousness that may proceed before drowning. For example, the patient had an LOC and he had a drowning later after that. So example, the most important one can be a hyperventilation. So suddenly due to panic, the patient has hyperventilated and uh, he had lost consciousness and he was he had a drowning or concussion injury, stroke, cardiac arrhythmias and major trauma. So these are the conditions that may cause LOC that may proceed before drowning. Now coming to the pathogenesis as such. So what happens after submersion? Victim holds breath for less than one minute before developing laryngoscopism. So that is the first step that will happen. Victim holds breath for less than a minute before developing laryngoscopism. Further, victim then frequently swallows larger quantity of water. That is the next step that is going to happen. And continue breath holding and laryngoscopism result in development of hypoxia, hypercapnia and acidosis. So that is a major culprit. You understand that continuous breath holding and laryngoscopism will start developing resulting in development of hypoxia, hypercapnia and acidosis. And when reflux abates, the aspiration of water will happen into the lungs and amount of aspirated water decides the degree of hypoxemia. So let's see what happened once again after submersion victim holds breath for less than one minute before developing laryngospasm then victim frequently swallows larger quantity of water and continue breath holding and laryngospasm resulting in development of hypoxia, hypercapnia and acidosis and when reflexes are abolished aspiration of water into the lungs occurs and then amount of water aspirated decides the degrees of hypoxemia. Now what are the other lung injuries? One lung injury what we have described is the basic uh, problem with the ventilation perfusion mismatch. Let's see what are the other and as I told the amount of water aspirate decides hypoxemia, surfaction dysfun uh, dysfunction or washout of complete surfactant, alveolar collapse can occur, alveolar collapse further result in exacerbation of fluid plasma and electrolyte shift and pulmonary edema again one of the deadliest complications is the pulmonary edema. Uh, how what is the pathophysiology in fresh water due to the permeable alveolar capillary and transient hypolemia uh, pulmonary marker in salt water due to osmotic gradient diving fluid into the alveolar, alveolar capillary. So uh, you have to uh, pathogenesis is a little bit different for pulmonary in fresh water and salt water and reduced respiration further the patient will uh, victim will have decreased respiration which result in atelectasis intrapulmonary shunting, decreased lung compliance and finally the ventilation perfusion mismatch. So these are the lung injuries that can happen further following your drowning. So uh, we have said the pathophysiology and uh, what exactly happening to the lungs and finally bronchospasm also. So if no rescue bar ventilation is happening within the time frame, hypoxemia will lead on to loss of consciousness, apnea and multi-organ dysfunction further into cardiac arrhythmia, pul pulseless electrical activity and dysystole. And there can be additional effect on respiratory system like impaired gas exchange, injury to alveolar capillary membrane directly itself and later on a secondary lung infection. Now effect to the CNS basically it causes cerebral hypoxia and there can be raised intracranial pressure also resulting cerebral edema also which we will discuss and how to manage that also and hematological there can be hemolysis, hemolysis occur due to profound hypoxia. So you have to understand that vast majority of drowning victim more than 98% reported to aspirate water. So lack of water in lungs on autopsy suggests other cause of death. So when you have somebody as uh, as a forensic expert is evaluating and he says that there is no uh, water inside the lungs, you have to consider some foul play or maybe he would have died before drowning. He, the cause of death is not due to drowning. So there is a grading system of drowning as per symptom severity. You have you can see grade 1 to grade 6 symptoms. Uh, first you have can see the response to stimuli from grade 1 to grade 4 there will be response to stimuli and in physical assessment grade 1 normal pulmonary auscultation with cuff grade 2 abnormal pulmonary auscultation with rails in some lung fields 3 abnormal pulmonary auscultation with rails in all lung fields with normal blood pressure grade 4 abnormal pulmonary auscultation with rails in all lung fields that is pulmonary edema with hypotension or shock. It is just similar to our Clips classification that we use uh, for the pulmonary edema in the acute coronary syndrome. And uh, grade 5 is pulse present after auscultation or rescue breath. 6 pulse absent even after rescue breath. Submersion time less than 1 hour without obvious physical evidence of death. That is 
obvious risk level now that what we uh, expect is that there is no rigor mortis liver mortis or there is no decomposition that means uh, the uh, if the uh, uh, submersion time is less than 1 hour because of the hypothermia the chance of uh, developing rigor mortis is less so if even at all if it is resuscitated within less than 1 hour you can try resuscitation so that is the idea behind it so that is the grading of drowning as per symptom severity now coming to the management aspect which is the most important as you know any emergency how will you tackle that is the stabilization of ABCD but here the priority is stabilizing the airway breathing that is the priority because the primary reason that is happening in drowning is due to your problem with your airway and breathing specifically to breathing also. So let us see what all things needed to be done. Assess for response to verbal and tactile stimuli. If no response, assess for adequation of ventilation and pulse. Remember your BLS algorithm that uh, applies good here also. So the same BLS algorithm you should be remembering. If response, auscultate for rails. Consider all the rescued victim as a trauma victim because we doesn't exactly doesn't know how uh, maybe he had an RT and he was thrown out of the vehicle or uh, maybe a suicide attempt. We exactly doesn't know. So consider them as a trauma victim and uh, you need to keep in mind uh, regarding the cervical spine injury. We will discuss how to do the cervical immobilization in the later part of the video and clearing airway and maintaining patency in airway. That is the most important. You have to maintain an airway and patency of the airway and clearing of the airway and in breathing respiratory rate saturation look for pulmonary rails and uh, role of advanced airway and definitely airway if at all back mass ventilation continue your positive back mass ventilation circulation heart rate bp and look for arrhythmias that is very important in a, in a patient especially hypothermia the patient will be having uh, prone to develop various sort of uh, arrhythmias then gcs less than 13 that is again one of the indication for a definitive airway and uh, in children look for the avpu score and in all patients look for the pupillary uh, asymmetry and look for any evidence of head injury and most importantly prevention of hypothermia and early rewarming is the key and core body assessment ideally by the esophageal probe or epidemic sensor so that is the uh, recommendation so possible core body temperature should be measured by the help of a esophageal probe or a epidemic sensor so to the investigations uh, what all investigations that you need to send the most important one uh, when the patient arrives to your ED will be your ABG look for the evidence of hypoxia hypercapnia or metabolic acidosis complete blood count again uh, if there is prolonged hypoxia there can be hemolysis electrolytes all electrolytes sodium potassium to be very specific chest x-ray look for the evidence of pulmonary edema ECG you can look for the hypothermic changes that is the J point elevation Osborne wave and look for arrhythmias bradycardia premature ventricular contractions, ventricular fibrillation, prolonged PR bar QTC bar QRS complex. So these all things can happen uh, in your ECG. And CT brain is warranted if you suspected a head injury following drowning and uh, definitely the role of your point of care ultrasound uh, to assess your uh, LV function as well as the fluid status of the patient and uh, maybe an early uh, picking up of your pulmonary edema with your uh, ultrasound probe. And also a talk screen is warranted because uh, whether the patient was under any influence of alcohol or not, we are not very sure. So talk screen or maybe he might be on some anti-epileptics, whether he has overdose or maybe subtherapeutic dose. So may, you may need to send uh, the drug levels also, uh, RFT, creatine kinase and cardiobiomarkers. And later on, you need to think in terms of bacterial culture, especially tracheal and blood and EEG later, maybe to look for the evidence of hypoxia if there is cerebral hypoxia. So these are the nutshell investigations that you need to send from the ED. And this is a classical uh, uh, ECG representation showing you the Osborne wave. Osborne wave, uh, you can see the J point elevation and the how the J point has elevated and uh, changed as the J point elevation, which is seen in, uh, which is called as Osborne wave, which is seen in hypothermia. Now coming to the priorities in management, what are the priorities? Recovery and stabilization of adequate ventilation, oxygenation and perfusion. So that is the key here and recover victim from water and begin immediate resuscitation. So to try to recover the victim as early as possible and begin immediate resuscitation. Maintain patient in vertical position during water recovery and supine position on land. Spinal immobilization, again spinal immobilization should be considered when you know exactly the mechanism of injury. As I told, it is following an road traffic accident. So there is a high chance of uh, 
cervical in spine injury but do not delay recovery from water and spinal uh, immobilization may not be indicated if mechanism of injury but history is very clear so you are already know that uh, what has happened exactly maybe by knowing the mechanism by the history you should not uh, delay the recovery from water for spinal immobilization so consider resuscitation effort even if patient submerged for a longer period if hypothermia is present so role of prolonged cpr that is one uh, area so as i previously mentioned if it is less than 1 hour and there is no evidence of uh, uh, rigor or liver mortis you can consider uh, your prolonged now coming to cpr so when we talk regarding cardiopulmonary resuscitation uh, as per the 2000 and whatever the changes has happened the cab of cpr but here it is the abc because the primary cause is to your airway and breathing so traditional approach of airway breathing circulation approach should be used here and uh, start ventilation rather than circulation airway breathing so that is one change where we will use abc and back mask for respiratory distress or respiratory arrest and continue cpr uh, then uh, who are submerged for 60 minutes and lack obvious physical evidence of death as i previously mentioned no rigor body decomposition liver mortis you continue your cpr compression ratio again 30 is to 2 uh, 15 is to 2 in case of a pediatric when you have more than one rescuer no abdominal thrust or hemolysis maneuver which should not be uh, done at all uh, which uh, is wrongly practiced uh, drive uh, victim before using an aed again that is the most important thing because you have to make sure that you yourself is safe before using a aed or defibrillator so drying the victim properly before you are using an aed and ventilation if no observed breathing there is no breathing after rescue give five rescue breaths instead of two so primarily here as i told the problem is within your a and b so you give five rescue breaths instead of two if available supplement rescue breaths with oxygen so if oxygen is available nearby you supplement the rescue breaths with the help of oxygen. now coming to the ventilation again there are uh, these are all ilcor guidelines as and uh, bmj position paper what i am discussing so there are certain changes uh, uh, regarding ventilation so we have to be careful uh, when you are going through this uh, video so if victim is in shallow water start rescue breathing if safety or rescue safety of rescuer is not compromised so in the chain of survival itself we have told if victim in deep water the victim is in a deep water open airway and if no spontaneous breathing start in water rescue in breathing that should be done only with the trained hands so a normal uh, emt might not be trained in this or a normal uh, rescuer may not be trained so who has specialized training who has got that aids only will be able to do so and give 10 to 15 breaths over one minute and if victim is less than 5 minutes from land so the drowning has happened and the victim is just 5 minutes away from land continue rescue breathing while towing also and if victim more than 5 minutes from land give further rescue breaths for 1 minute and then respond transport to land as quickly as possible so uh, if the uh, distance from rescuing will be take more than 5 minutes you give 1 minute continuously breath and then transport to land as quickly as possible and recovery position suction should be done if uh, stomach contents start regurgitation so that is the uh, to prevent further aspiration already uh, there is a high chance that uh, while doing compression or while rescuing also uh, the patient can uh, regurgitate and it can further aspirate so that should be prevented so coming to the most important part as i told is the airway and breathing management patients who are protecting the airway with mildly labored breathing so here the airway they are protecting but they have got labored breathing they can be started with oxygen by face mask at a rate of 15 liter ideally by a non rebreathing mask with a goal of spo2 between 92 to 96 so that is our target 92 to 96 they are mild only there is mild labored breathing if the patient ventilatory status mental state or uh, saturation decline go ahead and do an endotracheal intubation don't wait here go ahead and do an endotracheal intubation patients who are protecting their airway with increased breathing effort requiring support and who are maintaining sufficiently to follow commands may be trialed on a non invasive positive pressure ventilation but again there is a higher risk of aspiration so what we suggest is that less than gcs 13 it is better to go ahead and intubate because already they have aspirated now again you don't want to increase the risk of aspiration the patient does not improve again there is clinical intubation continue to the endotracheal intubation patients not protecting their airway or not performing adequate ventilation should be oxygenated via mouth to mouth mouth to mask or back mask ventilation as a bridge to endotracheal intubation so we don't have your uh, endotracheal intubation it is getting delayed so go ahead with your back mask ventilation if endotracheal intubation is performed a mechanical ventilation should follow ventilation strategy similar to that of what we use in ARDS 
so uh, low tidal volume high peep so we will discuss that if eta equipment is not available you don't have any uh, endotracheal tube with you or airway assessment suggests that et is likely to be difficult a supraglottic airway devices can be tried so uh, extraglottic devices can be tried but if the supraglottic device does not result in sufficient ventilation remove the device and continue with your back mask ventilation so what holds the important thing if you have an eti endotracheal intubation go ahead otherwise go ahead with your positive pressure back mask ventilation so that is equally good if advanced care facility is very nearby and back mask ventilations are adequate to maintain an spo2 of more than 95 percentage it can be continued as a bridge to eti at the advanced care center so till the uh, center you re reaching the center you can continue with the back mask ventilation so the key message is that those who are not protecting the airway go ahead and intubate as early as possible if you are able to do that well and good if you don't have that equipment you can try an extraglottic device but back mask ventilation is equally effective so during transportation and in ear because why i am saying during transportation and ear is that uh, during transportation also you need to continue the resuscitation once the patient reaches the ear also the management is almost the same monitor vitals most important oxygen target of 94 to 98% ensure optimal oxygenation before endotracheal intubation uh, so already there is hypoxia so you have to pre-oxygenate very well and Crickard pressure can be used to prevent aspiration so Crickard pressure again uh, in RSI it has been removed for routine use but in this situation where you are suspecting uh, a uh, high chance of aspiration you can still go ahead with your Crickard pressure that may uh, have a difficulty for your intubation but Crickard pressure holds good and suctioning the airway with a proper angle suction device is uh, again one of the most modern priority and set an FiO2 to target an SpO2 of around 94 to 90, 98 percentage so that should be your target after the endotracheal intubation and PEEP should be 5 to 10 mmHg titrate PEEP accordingly to maintain an SpO2 or a PO2 more than 300 that is the initial setting but later on you can decrease on your FiO2 as well as your PEEP so uh, what you have to remember is that lung protective ventilation similar to that of ARDS that is a low tidal volume high PEEP tidal volume less than 6 ml per kg so uh, that will be your uh, strategies then most important thing is that you have to understand what is a respiratory arrest and what is a cardiac arrest because in, uh, it will be uh, difficult to uh, differentiate it because in this victim uh, difficult to palpate the pulse so with the ED you have a facility of an uh, echo mission uh, or an ultrasound you can go to the carotids and see the CASA protocol but in certain scenarios it will be difficult so use an ETCO2 if it is available continuous ECG monitoring these all things should be done and prevention of hypothermia again holds good while uh, you are transporting the patient so now coming to the cardiac arrest there are certain consideration from the routine ACLS management once cardiac arrest is management apply the basic life support and ACLS whatever the recommendation you have to do go ahead rewarm the patient as fast as possible if the patient is hypothermic Rewarm the patient as fast as possible. As possible, rewarming is the best antiarrhythmic and inotrope in this situation. So, rewarming the patient is the priority. Look for and treat comorbidities and consider alternative diagnosis. Don't just think that it is due to hypothermia. What there is, there are other causes of cardiac arrest also. Other H and Ts also. You should be thinking. Anticipate a prolonged resuscitation that could require significant multi-specialty unit. You need to have a uh, prolonged CPR. So, we need to get an extra. Now, coming to defibrillation and pacing. Defibrillation is less effective in hypothermia. So, so for VF and VT, defibrillation may be tried up to three times, but is then not tried until the temperature reaches 30 degrees Celsius. So, once it reaches above 30 degree only, you will start uh, trying the uh, defibrillation. Pacing is generally ineffective. Do not try it unless bradycardia persists when normothermia is reached. Sinus bradycardia may be physiological response and is not treated. Now coming to the resuscitation drugs. Drugs are often indicate ineffective and will undergo reduced metabolism. So these are withheld below 30 degrees Celsius. Then given uh, with twice the time interval between the doses until normothermia is approached or circulation is restored. So uh, less than 30 you withhold the drugs above 30. Uh, maybe every uh, like uh, you give epinephrine 1 mg every 3 to 5 minutes routinely so here you can wait like 8 to 10 minutes uh, twice the time of normal you can wait uh, till the uh, victim has become normothermic so adrenaline would be given about every 8 to 10 minutes once the core temperature is above 30 degrees Celsius still normothermia is achieved once normothermia is achieved so the regular resuscitation uh, protocol that is epinephrine every uh, 3 to 5 minutes you can continue 
Now coming to the rewarming can be passive or active that is internal or external. In patient with perfusing rhythm, passive measure may be sufficient. Passive measure will only achieve rewarming in a patient with effective circulation. So remove wet clothing and dry the patient, co uh, cover the patient head, ensure a warm environment, cover the patient with a blanket, a forced air warming blanket like a bear hugger will be more effective in the scenario. Now coming to what are the other medications that you need to consider, broad spectrum antibiotic, yes, uh, because as you know, uh, the water can be contaminated, we exactly doesn't know. So you can start with the broad spectrum antibiotic, maybe uh, third generation cephalosporin to start with or an anti-pseudomonal penicillin uh, or a carbipenems to start with and uh, you can, uh, depending upon the patient scenario, you can decrease the antibiotic, de-escalate further after your culture and sensitivity and also uh, consider for the anaerobic coverage and antifungal depending upon the uh, where exactly the patient has drowned. Uh, consider an antifungal and anaerobic, that's what I have mentioned. Again, uh, clindamycin will be the drug of choice. Uh, treat bongabosum with your salbutamol multi-dose inhalers or nebulizers. Surfactants replacement has got less evidence. Cerebral resuscitation uh, again has got less evidence with barbiturates. Phenytoins for seizure as it has got less sedative effect because you wanted to see how the patient is recovering. So uh, phenytoin can be used as a drug of choice. But again, cardiac arrhythmia, you have to be careful when using phenytoin. Uh, preferred fluid of choice is 0.9% saline. Don't use hypotonic saline, should be avoided and uh, electrolyte management, sodium, potassium and all your electrolyte management has to be done. Now, uh, other strategy, ECMO, there are multiple studies which showing the ECMO has got, uh, because you have got some time for resuscitation in the ED, because uh, until the normothermia is achieved, will be resuscitation. So, ECMO definitely has got a role in uh, drowning and ICP monitoring is warranted. Uh, if you have suspected raised ICP, definitely yes, you need to have an ICP monitoring, uh, magnetol, role of magnetol, yes. Therapeutic hypothermia or targeted temperature management, initial 24 hours. Now the evidences are decreasing, uh, maybe in the next ACLS guidelines uh, will have a different approach. But as of now, yes, we should uh, recommend uh, tem targeted temperature management following a cardiac. Come, coming to the uh, complications, death occurs due to basically due to the ARDS, multi-organ dysfunction, sepsis syndrome and post-hypoxic encephalopathy. So these are the main reason why death occurs. And there can be also other complications like pulmonary edema, hypoxia, cerebral edema, raised ICP, hypothermia, sepsis, DIC, shock, myoglobinuria and hemoglobin, etc. And uh, we have a small conclusion because uh, a lot of people are preparing for NEET. So there can be forensic autopsy finding of drowning, aspiration drowning uh, uh, medium in lengths. Uh, you can get the aspirator drowning medium in lengths and uh, you can get the weeds or sand in airways. Uh, white or uh, blood tinged froth at the mouth or nostrils can be seen. Frothy fluid in conducting airway. Large and bulky, uh, it is not kidneys, it is lungs that completely occupy the pleural cavity. Sorry for the typo. Uh, brick red the appearance of the cut section of the lung with large quantity of edema. Uh, Palatose hemorrhage, that is again one of the neat questions. It, it is basically a subpleural hemorrhage. Uh, you, see, uh, you can see pink lungs in fresh water and bluish red in salt water drowning. What is the significance? I don't know, but this question might come for your neat uh, uh, PG exam. So, uh, palatose hemorrhage you can remember. Absence of water in the stomach again suggests either rapid death by drowning or death before submersion. To conclude, we have a beautiful flowchart that uh, I have taken from the BMJ position paper. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the diagnosis and uh, the management of a drowning victim can be seen from this chart. The initially, check for responsiveness of the victim response. No response, open the airway and check for breathing. If breathing, perform pulmonary auscultation. If not breathing, give 5 uh, rescue breaths and check for carotid pulse. That is the priority. If pulse is absent, obvious physical evidence of death, Rigor mortis, everything is there. That's it. Forensic evaluation. If there is no pulse but there is evidence no obvious physical evidence of death it is grade 6 again so start cpr as per the uh, guidelines whatever recommended is the abc sequence and if there is pulse present and it is grade 5 then it will become grade 5 that is no response uh, with pulse present start artificial ventilation your endotracheal intubation the management of your airway breathing and shifting the victim to your uh, intensive care unit and now we will come to the response the patient has got response Perform pulmonary auscultation again. Again, it, it is divided into abnormal and normal. So, if it is abnormal, uh, rails in all area, again, with hypotension and without hypotension. So, with hypotension of shock, 
again the management is the airway breathing circulation you have to give adequate fluid resuscitation again admission into the intensive care unit and there is normal blood pressure stabilize your airway breathing circulation and airway and breathing priority is here because circulation is already okay here so a and b stabilization is the priority and abnormal uh, uh, again rails in some only in some areas so he has got just a grade 2 uh, drowning so maybe just an oxygen and antibiotics and other uh, uh, care will be sufficient maybe you can keep him in the ed for some time observation and maybe you can later on move to the ward and you have a normal lung fields again with cuff without cuff uh, both is grade 1 with cuff is grade 1 without cuff he don't have uh, any other uh, major symptoms so he can be ideally as per the guidelines he can be immediately uh, asked to go home from the scene itself but that won't happen in india so we'll keep him under observation so again uh, with cuff grade one advanced medical attention and oxygen should not be uh, should not be required so he can be asked to go home or keep under observation so that is in a nutshell uh, regarding the uh, drowning management so depending upon the victim's response Again, you divide into no response and response category and with pulse and without pulse. And to this side, uh, depending upon the uh, pulmonary auscultation, abnormal and normal, you have divided. So basically, with this grading system, you can easily remember the management of drowning. I hope it is clear. Uh, so as I told before, uh, I have uh, uh, used uh, multiple references for this presentation from the uh, ILCOR guidelines, from the New Zealand uh, guidelines, from the Australian guidelines, from the BMJ position paper and uh, ABC of resuscitation from Willis. So these are my uh, references and also from Dynamite. Thank you. Thank you for your patient listening.